sing together. My chains are gone. I've been set free. before we uh, sing this song together, but it's been years ago, uh, we was, they was having the taping at uh, the fort um, for Christmas years ago, and late at night when the taping was over and the music was done, I was walking to the parking lot, and the parking lot was empty, he had one car there, well, he had yeah, my car there, and that was it, and as I was walking out the parking lot, the man came up to me, and and I said, what's going on here? A man coming up to me in the pitch dark of the parking lot. And he walks up to me. He starts telling me a story about himself and all the things that were going on in his life. And he said, would you pray for me? I said, sure, I'll pray for you. So I laid my hands on him, and I, and I laid my hand on his shoulder, and we had our prayer. And after we had our prayer, he was gone. He left. And, but before he left, he said, you touched me. Why would you lay your hand on my shoulder for? And I said, because I wanted to feel what you feel. And I wanted to feel that touch on you that I could feel what you had just talked to me about so I would know when I prayed for you. But anyway, then he left. And, and then I, I thought about the song, uh, how Jesus would touch people and how he loved people to the point where he, he would touch them. And I thought about my life the day that Jesus touched me. And he touched me and he changed my life because of the touch of the master's hand. So we want to say, I want to sing a verse and I want you to join on the chorus. And I'll, uh, then we'll do another verse and, and a chorus. So listen to the words of the song and then you join with me on the chorus. He touched me. Matthew 9, 29. 
Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, let it be to you. And in Mark 10, 13, Then they brought the little children to him, and that he might touch them. In Luke 22, But Jesus answered and said, Permit even this, that even he touched his ear and healed him. Matthew 17, 7, But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, do not be afraid. In Matthew 8, 3, that Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing to be cleansed. Are you willing to be cleansed? Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. All because of the touch that Jesus touched the people, that they changed their life forever. Listen to the second verse. scripture that we memorized in this month. I'll get it out here in a minute. Let's repeat it together. He who seals his sins
Have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to uh, the Gospel according to Matthew. The Gospel according to Matthew. Before we uh, read the scripture, I'm going to share a few thoughts. Um, uh, Matthew 26 is where I'll be reading from. Um, but I don't know if you're like me, but I know that uh, sometimes, more often than not, I find myself watching the History Channel. Do you ever do that? Uh, it could be because of the shows catch my attention, or it could be that there's not much worth watching anywhere else. It seems like. I'm not sure. But um, oftentimes I find myself watching that, that channel. There's neat shows on there. One of which is uh, Inside Air Force One. That was intriguing to see things that uh, are on the Air Force One. Another one was America, the Story of Us. That was pretty interesting about history. And uh, I like this one as, as well that I saw, Amelia Earhart, uh, The Lost Evidence. Where is she? All those things. Kind of neat. And uh, also, uh, Buried, Knights Templar and the Holy Grail. I got caught into that one. Uh, but none of them really I got caught into uh, uh, on a, I guess, wanting to watch the whole series uh, was the one, Hunting Hitler. Did you ever watch any of that? That was really neat uh, to me, uh, where he was, if he, you know, all that is really interesting. But, you know, you think about history, though. History really and truly is his story. Uh, we have history, absolutely, but history is his story. And uh, God's story, his story, is a story of love. It is a story of grace and a story of mercy wrapped up in the gift of God coming to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we call that gift... Uh, we call it the gospel, and the gospel, uh, the word literally means good news. So his story is God coming to us, which is good news. And uh, the word gospel, uh, when you think about uh, it occurs uh, 93 times in the scriptures, uh, exclusively in the New Testament. Now, when you think about the gospel, broadly speaking, the gospel could be considered uh, the whole of scripture. You can say, yeah, this is the gospel truth. But uh, more narrowly speaking, uh, the good news, the gospel is good news concerning Jesus and God's way, uh, only way of salvation. Now, the key uh, for us to understand the gospel is uh, that it's good news. In order to do that, we first must understand that there is bad news first. Now, the bad news is that each and every one of us has fallen short of God's glorious standard, His perfect standard, and despite our best attempts, each one of us is in the same spiritual boat. We are spiritually lost. The Bible says very clearly, the gospel truth says, all have sinned and come short the glory of God. And the punishment of that sin is death, which is separation from God, and God is the source of all life. So that's what we know is true, and in order for us to be forgiven of our sin, uh, for our sin to be removed, uh, there has to be a, a perfect sacrifice that is made. And the good news is, in spite of the bad news that we're all sinners, the good news is that God sent His Son on a mission. Amen? Where would we be today without Jesus? When I think about where I would be, it causes me to tremble about what, uh, what, uh, where I was headed and now where I am, how I've been found by that amazing grace that we sung about. And uh, God sent his son on a mission uh, for those who are lost. Uh, he sent him on a mission for all. No one is excluded from that. And uh, Jesus uh, willingly offered himself on the cross of Calvary as a substitute, thus meeting God's perfect requirement. God's perfect standard. We know the scripture says very clearly that Jesus was without sin. And we know that as he gave of himself, he laid his life down as the perfect sacrifice. And really you could say this, the perfect for the imperfect. Jesus laid his life down. He was perfect 
for we who are imperfect, and we're all in that same boat. Now, we know on the third day, after he had been uh, crucified and buried, that glorious day, he arose from the grave. And the fact that Jesus conquered sin and death, sin's penalty, is good news indeed. And uh, he offers, uh, the good news is as well, he offers to share that good news with us. I want to read a scripture to you. You probably know it very well. It says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, what I've been referring to. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Amen. Not just a few. It goes on to say to the Jew, first the Jew and then the Gentile. There are Jews and Gentiles. We're in, you're in one of two groups. So it's for everyone that Jesus Christ came. And the gospel, when you think about it, it's a bold message that we are uh, shipwrecked. We, we cannot save ourselves, but yet God sent his son on a mission to save each and every one of us. So it's a, it's a bold message. And as we read in uh, uh, Romans chapter 1, it is a powerful message. It is a saving message. And the gospel is the only thing that can change a heart. The only thing. The gospel is the only thing that can, the sacrifice of Jesus is the only thing that can take away sin. The gospel. And the, the gospel is a, a universal message. It's for Jews and Gentiles. It's for both. It is for everybody. And it is received by faith. And salvation, as we read earlier, uh, as the scripture reading was, that salvation is a gift from God. It is a gift. Now, to reject the gospel, to reject God's plan, means to embrace the bad news. So everybody in this room, we're either embracing the gospel or we are embracing the bad news. We're rejecting God's plan. Now, those who reject God's plan of salvation are doomed. They are separated from God. And the gospel, we know, is good news. Uh, listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 3. He said these words. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. See, God has given the doomed world good news. The good news of Jesus Christ. And the eternal destiny of everyone depends upon whether or not they know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And uh, here's, a, here's a true statement. I, I brought nothing to the table of salvation except my need. That's all I brought to the table for salvation, my need. Had nothing to offer him, but the gospel we know is good news. And when you think about it, as a church, the gospel is why we exist. It is the purpose for which we gather together. We have a risen Lord. The world is doomed apart from Jesus Christ. And we gather together to lift up the name of Jesus and to get prepared for ministry as we live each week. The gospel, it's good news. It's really and truly uh, that's why we exist. And when you think about it, our goal is to bring men and women, boys and girls, to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's why we exist. And uh, helping people uh, across our street, wherever you live, and around the world to know that they are doomed, but they can be saved because God sent Jesus on a mission of rescue. And everybody that we know Everybody needs a personal relationship with Jesus. Everybody. Now, as we look back, I was thinking about, Libby and I were kind of brainstorming, brainstorming yesterday. As we look back, I was trying to think back. I'm sure I forgot something. I, I, I am positive of that. But we were brainstorming about things that, in 12 years, things that we've done because of the gospel. 
And we have a, a very rich uh, history as a church uh, uh, that I can remember. Uh, I remember how we started just uh, in January. It was a blisterly cold day, <laughs> Sunday afternoon. We met together with Annie McDonald, and we, he trained us in, a, in, a, in an old way but a new way to go door to door in our community to share the good news of Jesus. Now, I don't remember exactly the temperature of the day, but I do remember it was a blisterly cold wind that was blowing. So we started. We're going to wait till the weather breaks, more like today, but we're going to start uh, here shortly to finish up going door to door in our town because you know why? Our town needs Jesus. Amen. Amen. They need Jesus. But also I thought about this, the things that we have done. Uh, we have served in the concession stand across the street. Now, why do we do that? Do we do it because we get a free bag of popcorn? I like popcorn. The reason we do that is because of the gospel. We do it because we want to show God's love, no strings attached. Uh, uh, we started a, a one day after, a, a one hour, uh, one day a week after school program called MASH. We have taken families' meals for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Uh, we have participated and we do bottles of blessings for the Pregnancy Resource Center. Uh, we support missionaries home and abroad. Uh, we do vacation Bible school. We've had block parties. We uh, uh, provide transportation to our church for those who can't get here by themselves. Uh, we have passed out light bulbs. You say, why did you pass out light bulbs? Well, inside the light bulb it said, just stop to... I want you to be reminded that Jesus is the light of the world. We also, I remember this, uh, uh, we, passed, we passed out coffee when the time changed on that weekend, this weekend. And uh, I remember we had a, a relatively uh, new person in our church. And they, they, this, the vision they had in their mind was this, that uh, we were going to go door to door with a, a pitcher of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> that was their mindset. That's what they were thinking we were going to do, and she couldn't get her arms around that. How are we going to keep the coffee warm? How are we going to go door to door, have cups, all that? Well, we had a bag that had a, a, a serving of coffee that you had to cook yourself. We wanted them to remind them to put their clocks forward and just to remind them that God loves them. Why? Because of the gospel. That's why we do those things. Also, uh, uh, we, uh, we have participated in Kentucky Changers. Uh, we had a, a I, I, I had forgotten about this, but I hadn't been here very long. We had a firefighter's appreciation dinner. Gave them the movie Fireproof and had, had a meal here for them and shared the gospel with them. We also had, uh, have made salvation dolls uh, that were going to be passed out. And uh, GAs had a yard sale to raise money for missions on that, the big yard sale day. What is that? 127 yard sale? They had a whole bunch of stuff that we sold. And uh, uh, the children's mission group on Wednesday night, uh, they went driving. Well, they didn't go driving. I drove them around. You have to have a license to drive, right? The children, the boys, went out one Wednesday night. And I think it was seven or eight uh, people they shared the gospel with during church time. Why do we do that? The gospel. That's why we do those things. Also, I was thinking about this. We had a, a Valentine's uh, meals. We took them to our businesses in our town. We made parachutes for a, a voice of the martyrs to be dropped down in places where the gospel is not permitted. That they were going to fly over the country and drop out parachutes to share the gospel. That's pretty cool, I thought. Uh, also, we, have, uh, we had an end-of-school brownies uh, for uh, staff and, uh, and uh, teachers across the street. We have a senior tea for the girls, and we grill out with the guys to, to share the gospel. We have Bergen Days. It, it's no longer a thing. We hope they resurrect that, but we do that because uh, we share the gospel. My favorite thing at the Bergen Days, we had gospel bracelets and little beads, and we, we did those. They walked by. You grab their arm. You start telling the gospel right then as they walk by. They're, they're a captive. You've got their hand. They can't leave, right? They're hearing the gospel, right? We also gave away snow cones out. Well, I don't know how many we gave away. We gave away a bunch. And uh, I, they, they were free. And all the kids, they come by. Why are they free? Well, let me tell you why. Jesus paid it all. The gospel. That's why we do what we do. Uh, we have prayer walked at the school. Uh, we've had free gift wrap. Uh, not in Bethlehem. Now, those who have been here long, longest, uh, uh, we did that a long time ago. Uh, and I remember Miss Jane, she fixed the bread for us somehow outside. I don't know how that worked, but it was great. And we, we had all this stuff outside Little Bethlehem just to share the good news, the gospel. 
That's why we do what we do. And also, uh, the trunk or treat, that's what it was at first. Remember that? We'd been outside and decorated our trunks, and the community come by. And I remember one year they were lined up from uh, right by my house driveway to the dollar store in line to go through our trunks and treats. And that was a good thing, but it's hard to share the gospel outside by a trunk. Well, one year the Lord had some bad weather come our way. Ah, oh, we better have it inside. That changed the dynamic. We walk down this hallway and get candy in each doorway, decorated by those of you. They come through this side over here, they hear the gospel. Somehow, some way, and they get food on the way out. Why? Because the gospel. We have a mission that we are to do. Uh, we went to West Liberty when the tornadoes hit. Well, I remember we went to ha Haven of Rest. Uh, there was a, a, a facility there by the prison, and a pay, uh, families would go there and stay. And we would go, we went and cleaned their rooms after they would left uh, so that we could serve in that capacity. Why? The gospel. We've been to the bridge. How many have been to the bridge? I know Stephen has been. Uh, down in Nashville, we go serve food. Why? Because of the gospel. That's what we do. That's what we're all about. And uh, we had a motorcycle ride, a car show, uh, Easter outreach. We do Samaritan's Purse. Uh, I mean, I've just got a bunch of stuff. Now, why do we do those things? Because we have the gospel, the good news. The gospel is a message of this Bible that I hold in my hands. It's the message of Scripture. So we ought to know it. Also, you think about the gospel, it's God's plan of salvation, so we ought to believe it. And it's meant for everyone, so we ought to share it. The gospel, that's what we do. Now, I want to share this morning out of Matthew chapter 26. If you would stand with me, we'll read together. And I want you to think about um, some uh, individuals that are in this passage of Scripture that you will see that we can identify with. In verse number 6 and following, this is what it says. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste? They asked. The perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. I tell you the truth. Whenever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Now skip down to verse 15. It says, question, Judas asked, what are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to stand. Uh, on the truth of your word in honor of the reading. Lord, I pray this morning that as we have talked about the gospel and God, as we've read the scripture that we have stood in honor of, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. I pray that you would Hide me behind the cross, and I pray that no one hears a word I say, but they hear what you have to say. God, think with my mind, speak with my mouth, for they are yours. May we be receptive to what you have to say. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So as we walk through this passage together, uh, we're, I'm going to point out uh, three different people that are found in the scripture, and the first of which is the woman, and that is in verses 6 and 7, and, and this is what it says. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of a man known Simon as Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which he poured on his head. 
and he was reclining at the table. Now, what this teaches us is simply this, uh, this woman does, that uh, one who truly loves the Lord Jesus understands that no gift, no gift is too costly to be offered to him. And it's very clear in the text. It is a, a valuable piece of, uh, of pottery and a very expensive perfume. And it, it, was, it teaches us that uh, there's nothing that's too valuable, too costly to give unto him. Now, Mary obviously loved the Lord. Uh, her actions reflected this truth. And as the title today is, Proof is in the Pudding. It's very obvious in her actions that, that she loved the Lord. And uh, on this visit to uh, Bethany, uh, Jesus and his disciples gathered at the home at this Simon the leper. And this uh, Simon was a believer whom Jesus had cured of his leprosy. And this designation of Simon the leper was kind of past tense. It was uh, served to just to distinguish him from other Simons. You know, Simon the leper, the one who was healed by Jesus. Simon, that, that's the one. Now, the Bible says a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very, very expensive perfume. Very valuable. She poured it on his head as he was reclining at the table. And as she approached Jesus, she began pouring this ointment on his head. And the house, no doubt, I can imagine, was invaded with this uh, uh, sweet smell, uh, this fragrant ointment that she had poured out. Uh, have you ever watched a football game at the end of a game? Whether it's high school or college, the winning coach, they kind of get him off on the sidelines there and some people sneak up behind him. You know what I'm talking about? What are they fixing to do? Fixing to pull a Gatorade all over his head, right? Now, if I had won a game like that and I was a coach, they, they poured it all over. That's ice cold, ice cold. Those that poured it on me, if I was in that shoes, they'd be running their guts out. Next practice. No doubt in my mind. But they do that to celebrate uh, uh, the victory that has, uh, has uh, transpired. And this woman, in our text, does something kind of like that. Uh, but it uh, had a, a much more of a meaning. Now, she poured out this ointment on the Lord Jesus that was extremely valuable. Why would she do such a thing? Has she lost her mind? And obviously, as you read the text there, some thought that. They complained. Why this waste? Has she lost her mind? And uh, uh, why did she take this uh, precious ointment and pour it all over his head? I don't think she lost her mind. I think she was expressing her love. And nothing was too costly. To give the one that changed her life. Now love makes you do strange things. Amen? Really? Love makes you do strange things. Amen? Amen. Now, just watch some teenagers. Strange things. Right? Now love uh, will cause uh, some to rent billboards. Those who are older rent billboards and, uh, on the side of the road to express their love. Some uh, love expressed a, a kind of a crazy kind of thing. Uh, maybe at a ball game, they'll have a, uh, they're going to propose at a certain time of the game, and it's on the big screen. Love calls you to do strange things. Some buy ads in newspapers, and they express their love for somebody. Uh, some uh, I've read about, some have hired airplanes to ride the, in the sky, on the sky rider. And uh, some, I'm sure you've seen, have had their loved one's name tattooed somewhere on their body. Love will make you do strange things. It does. I read a story about a young man on a first date with a pretty young lady. And uh, it was come time for the end of the date, and uh, he was walking up to the front of the house, and he was thinking, it's time for that first kiss. That's what time it is. So she leans up against the house there, and they're talking, and he's got his hand up on the wall, kind of close, and, and he starts this dialogue with her, how about a good night kiss? She goes, oh, oh, no, no, no. My parents, uh, th they'll see. Oh, oh, come on, just, just one, one good night kiss. Come on, uh, uh, what, if your dad step, what if my dad steps out? Oh, your dad's asleep. Don't worry about that. Just give me, just give me one good night kiss. Oh, that's too risky. It's just too risky. Please, come on, just one, one kiss real quick, please. And please give me a kiss. And finally, her younger brother comes to the door. And this is what he says. Dad says, if he really wants a kiss that bad, 
he'll come down in just a moment and give him one. <laughs> but for crying out loud, get your name, your hand off the intercom. <laughs> You'll get that in a minute, maybe. Um, there's been a lot of crazy things done by people who are in love. And listen, it might seem crazy this woman would take a very expensive piece of pottery like it was, an alabaster box, and, and full of very costly ointment, and pour it on the head of the Lord Jesus. But it didn't seem crazy to her. See, she loved the Lord more than she loved that ointment. Do you see that? She loved Jesus more than the ointment. It was very valuable in that day, that day in standard. But she loved Jesus more. Uh, in 1944, Hallmark started an, an ad campaign, uh, when you care enough to give the very best. That's what this woman was doing. She cared enough to give the best that she had. And uh, uh, how many of you ever watched uh, the show Pawn Stars? You watch that? Surely more than me watch Pawn Stars. Um, that's kind of neat. You got Rick Harrison. You got Chumley. He's kind of funny sometimes. And you got Pops, the, the grandpa, and uh, Corey, and it's on the Vegas Strip. And the show has been, if it's renewed this year, 17 seasons. And if you've watched the show as I have, oftentimes they'll interview the person before they go in. This is what I've got. It's rare. It's valuable, whatever have you. They have all this stuff about it, and I'm going to get at least this much money for it, or I'm going to walk out. And they go in, and they have to call the experts in, right? You've seen that. Expert come in and either verify or say, well, no, it's not the real deal. But what's the real deal, they'll say, well, it's worth $1,000. What does Rick say? Well, I'll give you 500 for it. Retail's 1000 I've got to make some, and I'll heal off, right? You know, you've seen the shows I have. But some people are very, they say, no, no, it's worth a lot more than that to me, and I, I'm just not going to sell it for that. This woman had that attitude. There's nothing that I have that's more valuable than Jesus. She took her very best that she had and she broke it and poured it on the head of the Lord Jesus. Uh, she felt that he was worth more than anything else and uh, anything she possessed, uh, Jesus was worth more. Uh, he, Jesus, deserved her best. Now, can you identify with the woman today? Can you say, I feel the same way. There's nothing in my hands that are more valuable to me than Jesus. Do, do we feel that way today, that he is the most valuable thing of all? He's more valuable than anything I possess. That's what the woman was saying. Now, the second group I want us to look at is uh, the disciples. It, it says this, when the disciples saw this, they saw her act of love, her, her act of devotion. When they saw this, they were indignant. And in one translation I read this morning said they grumbled. They were indignant. Why this waste? Now, when you read that, you think, I can understand their thought process. Um, you know, it could have been given to the poor. I would think it was probably a, a thought that those that may not know Jesus would say, in my opinion. Why, why this waste? Well, this is his disciples who are saying that. Disciples that were called from the fishing boat to follow him. Disciples that had left whatever they were doing to follow after him. They had set their, their course with wherever Jesus was going. The disciples said, they grumbled, they, they murmured, they, they were indignant. Why this waste? Why this sacrifice? Why did she give her very best? It appears to me that in America that there are many who feel this way about Jesus. Now let me just say a, a few thoughts. Uh, uh, some, uh, obviously, the proof's in the pudding. Some, they won't tithe. Their actions speak very loudly. Some won't give an offering. Their actions speak very loudly. 
It's amazing to me that things that we think are valuable or we put value on in our lives, this woman, uh, she loved the Lord and she gave her very best, but these disciples said, that's a waste. That's just a big waste. There are still people like that uh, today. Some claim to be Christian. Things a waste to, to put the Lord above everything else. Proof's in the pudding. There are those who think it's a waste to uh, give your time for Sunday evening worship or, or Wednesday or uh, midweek service. and uh, Their time's just too valuable. They'd rather sit home and do whatever. Proof's in the pudding. And by giving uh, uh, Jesus her best, the Lord knew, he knew that she loved him. We may say with our lips lots of things, oh, we love the Lord, but our actions reveal really if we do love him. You've heard it, haven't you said, outside the, outside the church? Well, their actions speak louder than the words. It's also true in here. I want you to think about this for a moment. Uh, when a person gives the Lord their time, you know what they're giving them? Their sales. We all have so many hours that we are going to be allowed to live according to God's plan. Our days are ordered. Our hours are numbered. So when we give him our time, we're giving him our sales. And uh, when you, you think, uh, uh, when a person uh, says, I I'm not going to do that, what they're simply saying is, I've got better things to do. And I know that's not true. But our actions speak loud. Um, if you think that way, Satan has got you thinking just like he wants you to think. And uh, uh, make no mistake about it, there are those that would be complaining today if someone gave their very best to the Lord, they'd start complaining. They've got better use of their time or the money than to give it to the Lord. And that's why the way some feel about missions... Uh, about those uh, across the waters and around uh, our neighborhood that don't know Christ. That's the way some feel about Sunday school or uh, serving in whatever capacity in our church, uh, either it be MASH or uh, VBS or uh, uh, investing in the kingdom of God in one of these ways that we're trying to show God's love. I, I know of a father, and it broke my heart when I heard this, I know of a father whose son had decided to go away from the um, uh, state college to go to a Bible college because God had called him to preach. And this is what the father said to me. I've invested all this money. Now my son's going to throw it all away. What a waste. He'd be complaining. He was. So who can you identify with? You, you identify with the woman? Do you say, yeah, there's nothing that I have that's more valuable than you. I, and I give him my very best. Or are you like the disciples here in our text there that you're, well, why this waste? Why do we want to give him our very best? But also notice, if you will, this uh, third person, the sinner. And that's in the next section of Scripture. Uh, I read verse 15 to you, but uh, after all this happens, uh, uh, there is uh, one of the twelve, it says, called Judas. Went at the chief priest and he asked, what are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? What kind of man was Judas? I think he was a coin collector. Judas was real close to Jesus. He was out there in his midst. But if you really look at it in our text, in the context of these three different individuals I'm picking out of the text, is this Judas valued coins more than he valued Jesus. Do you see it? Now, today, there are people like Judas. Uh, they, they're coin collectors. Some collect antiques. And uh, they collect whatever it may be. I, I heard a funny story. Uh, a group was guided, being guided through the Buckingham Palace, and they are being shown all the many valuable furniture and where it came from, all this. And the tour guide said, see that bed over there? Uh, that goes back to Henry VIII. No doubt this person was from... Uh, I'll say Madison County, that's where I was from. No doubt, somebody from Madison County stood up and said, well, that's nothing. So what? It's going back to Henry VIII. 
if we don't make a payment on our dresser, it's going back to Sears on the 15th. <laughs> some collect antiques. Some collect, I call them dust catchers. I think all three in my house besides me, I'm probably guilty too, but I don't think as much. Whatnots. I got a house full of whatnots, don't you? They're laying everywhere, and you got to dust around those whatnots. They're, I call them things you have to dust around. Uh, also, there's those who have resources, they collect cars. Nothing wrong with that. Some collect baseball cards, some collect tools, some collect shoes, some collect clothes, all kinds of different things, but we, we place value on lots of things. Judas. I believe if you read 14 and 15, the verses there, he's a coin collector. To him, the coins uh, were uh, more valuable to him. That's silver. Uh, uh, Judas, uh, 30 pieces of silver. Judas, his actions speak very loudly, proofs there in the pudding. And uh, he was very close to Jesus physically. He had some responsibility. He was the treasurer. Crying out loud. He, he's probably looked up to. And that just tells us you can be physically close to Jesus and have everybody fooled. You can't fool Jesus. Jesus fooled everybody. Nobody was confused. Uh, uh, he, he fooled everybody. They were all confused, but he didn't fool Jesus. In, in John chapter 6, it says, Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve, yet one of you is the devil? He didn't fool Jesus. Everybody else was fooled. His, his actions reveal really how he felt about the Lord. He was willing to sell him out for 30 pieces of silver, uh, something he could probably hold in one hand. One hand. And if uh, we were there and we saw Judas, you'd probably say, oh, he's, he's, a, he's a good follower. Look how, look, look at that. But his actions proved otherwise. In John chapter 21, uh, verse 15, it says, uh, When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Now, if Jesus had had 30 pieces of silver in his hands and held them out to Judas... And said, do you truly love me more than these? We know what Judas would have done. No, Lord, I love these coins more than I love you. Jesus, Judas was a sellout. So here's where I want to end today. We all have things. All of us do. Is there anything in our hands, things, that we value more than Jesus? Are we like Mary, the woman in, in the text? Are we like that woman? Give him our very best. Nothing's more valuable than Jesus. We'll give him all the, the very best we have. Or are we like the disciples? Do we identify with them? Why this waste? And there's Judas. You know, we started talking about the gospel at the very beginning. Has there been a time that you have trusted Jesus as your Savior? That you're willing, I don't bet, but you're willing to bet your eternity on? Ever been that time where you trusted Jesus? If not, today you can because of His grace. Why would you postpone that decision? Why would you wait till next Sunday or wait till Thursday? Why, why would you wait? I don't know why, but I know what I did. When I first came aware of the gospel, going to church three times a week, I argued and I fussed and I was arguing with God about things. I don't know why I did. 
But I know this for a fact. I wish I'd done it sooner. I do. So has there ever been that time where you trusted Jesus? Or maybe you'd say these words. You'd say, yeah, there's been that time. But I've not been giving Jesus my best, and I've been just like those disciples. Why the waste? i got a life to live. Jesus is our life. And the Scripture says we should live for the one who died for us. That's what the Scripture says. Or maybe, maybe there's something you need to do. Maybe you need to follow through with some type of decision. Maybe the waters of baptism. Maybe church membership. I don't know, but you know. So I want to ask you to be like that woman this morning. Whatever we have, the very best, just lay it, give it to him. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for today. We rejoice in the opportunity we have to, to hear your word, your truth. And I pray, Father, that this woman in the text, many think it was Mary, this woman in the text, that, Lord, we would be like her. We would give our very best. And, Lord, if there's someone that is here today that has never crossed that line from death to life, that today, this day, they would say, I want Jesus as my Savior. They would step out of their pew and come take me by the hand, and we could kneel together. And we could pray. I pray for those that may be here that may have wandered astray. Maybe physically close to Jesus, but they kind of out of whack. Uh, they see things as a waste to give to Jesus. God, I pray they would be, we would be revived. God bless this time now together. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's sing at the cross.
Everyone said? Amen. Amen. Well, thank you all for being here today.